uh, that we have scheduled uh, to meet with the ESCOM. And this arises out of our interaction in the past with ESCOM, uh, where we had invited ESCOM to specifically, you know, make a, a report or report on specific issues that we have requested them to come and respond. And uh, I just want to one upfront the committee that we might be having a very lengthy uh information uh that um that i've looked at uh and all of us we have uh, looked at it's, it it might take us very long but uh during the presentation i would request that uh they should be managed in such a way that we are able to finish uh, at least uh a sizable bulk of the work uh, because we did not anticipate that we'll have such a very lengthy uh, presentation, but I would request the ESCOM delegate to manage that presentation such that now all important corner corners have been, uh, have been reached uh, because by the look of the thing, it's like wood have uh, close to two days trying to unpack the presentation. But then uh, let me welcome you and uh, welcome uh, uh, Minister uh, uh, Bravin. Uh, so you are welcome uh, uh, in this meeting. Can I go to apologies? If there are any apologies, uh, uh, Professor Mahova has already rendered uh, his apology, Darren. Yes, uh, I think, Chair, two apologies. The first one is from Mr. Butelezi, who is the chairperson of the committee. And then the second one is from Mr. Kwankwa. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, with those apologies, uh, accepted. <clears throat> Can we now move to... ESCOM uh, and morning, invite Chair. ESCOM morning. to... Morning, Chair. Okay, morning, uh, Honorable uh, Minister. Yeah, I think the normal protocol is to ask the Minister to say some introductory things, if I may remind you of that. Uh, mm -hmm. so when it suits you, please let me know. Okay. Uh, uh, let me do so. In fact, uh, because I was just about to say ESCOM, so I, I appreciate that. So I think it's proper that we start with the minister's uh, uh, remark on the on ESCOM. Let me give uh, Minister Pravin to to make a, a remark. Thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Good morning to you, and good morning to the other honourable members and to the interim chair of the ESCOM board and the ESCOM executives. Um, what, what you will have is a presentation from ESCOM on uh, deviations and other related matters. And uh, I want to emphasize at the beginning, arising from previous experience, that um, as far as ESCOM is concerned, is these are necessary business processes required by the PFMA that ESCOM has to engage in should there be changes. Some of them are easily explainable. Some of them go into history. So that's my first point. The second chair is the duplication in parliament. The same presentation was made to the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. And my appeal to you is that we rationalize these processes so that ESCOM executives can get on with their work and through uh, the ministry uh, account appropriately to parliament as well. So I just want to place that on record so that at some stage uh, with yourself and with the chair, we can actually have that uh, discussion. But otherwise, thank you very much for your invitation and uh, we can then hand over to the chief executive to take you through the presentation. Good morning, uh, 
Honourable Chair. And, uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Can I now invite uh, the group executive to come in? And I want to allocate a, a minimum of minutes for, to try and uh, round up all the presentation. We will see how do we move forward uh, thereafter. Uh, can I invite you, uh, Mr. Director? Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members. Good morning also to uh, Minister Gordon and members of the ESCOM Board. Uh, it's again an uh, honour and a privilege to present uh, to the committee on uh, various matters raised by the committee in its invitation. So um, we have... Uh, as you correctly point out, a voluminous presentation covering a large number of different topics. Uh, this is intended to uh, be as transparent as possible. We will be guided by yourself, uh, Honorable Chair, um, with regard to uh, our presentation, uh, if you wish us to uh, speed up or focus on particular topics. Uh, so please, uh, if I may, request your guidance in this regard. Um, I'm going to request um, our uh, General Manager of Stakeholder Relations, Natasha Satole, to please share her screen so that we can start with the uh, presentation, please. Right, thank you very much. Um, and let's immediately move into uh, the next slide. Uh, as per the request from the um, committee, we are going to be covering a wide range of different topics. They are uh, extensive and they are quite detailed. Uh, so we will try and proceed as expeditiously as possible. Moving on to the next slide, please, Natasha. Let's then uh, start with the uh, overview to expansions and deviations. And if I may invite our Chief Financial Officer, Caleb Kassam, to uh, make introductory remarks before we go into the individual expansions and deviations. Caleb, please. Uh, thank you to you, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. Thanks. Uh, uh, as we know, uh, yes. you will see in, 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 a, in, a, okay. in the next slide, that ESKIM looks at deviations and expansions on an exception basis compared to the portfolio of contracts that we do have. And we adhere to the principles uh, that are envisaged around fairness, equitability, transparency, competitiveness, yeah. and co cost efficiency. Um, I think it's important to, to just highlight to the honorable members that where we do have single source procurement, we, uh, and this may exist for certain transactions, in particular where it relates to continuity of service, if there has been site establishment and we want to ensure we don't waste time on a project, that will come through some of the explanations later, Honorable Chair. But however, we do require prior approval from National Treasury before we proceed with single source procurement. From a sole source supplier perspective, honorable members, uh, we are not required to get prior approval from National Treasury. And once where we do have deviations and expansions, uh, we need to get support and the deviations uh, support uh, needs to occur. Otherwise we have to proceed with testing the market for new contracts. Chairperson, uh, I think we've also later in the presentation will demonstrate in terms of the equity support from the, the committee that ESCOM has been compliant over the last financial year. And we'll go into details later. If I just move on to the next slide, just to highlight the context uh, in terms of the exceptions. ESCOM for the financial year 2021 entered into 1,109 new contracts in total. So all our contracts that are existing in 2021 
including the new ones, total just over 4,000 contracts. Now you will see in the graphic above, out of those 4,000 con contracts, we made applications to National Treasury for 30 deviations, 46 expansions, which total 76 um, cumulatively. And you will see that the graphic on the right-hand side is just illustrating the status of all those applications with conditionally supported comprising 33 from expansions as well as 11 conditionally supported deviations. Not supported honorable chair uh, was 15 in total uh, of which eight related to expansions and seven to deviations. National Treasury has supported 15 in total. We have withdrawn one during the year and there's one outstanding feedback. Just to illustrate that the applications that we've made to National Treasury as a percentage of our total contract base of 4,034 represents around 0.7% for deviations and 1.1% for expansions. And in terms of applications that are not supported, the 15, as I've highlighted, from a deviation perspective, it's 0.2% of open contracts and 0.17 of expansions that were not supported. Jefferson, uh, thank you for that. If we can move on to the next slide, we will start going into more detail around the not supported transactions. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thanks, Andre. Thank you very much, Caleb. If I can ask uh, our group executive um, in charge of the generation business, Philip Dukashi, to please uh, quickly take us through this request, please. Thank you, um, Andre, honorable members. Um, so this this one pertains to a request that was made to National Treasury to approve the solicitation of goods from a limited uh, market, and this is for the manufacture and supply of uh, air heater spares for generation power stations. Now, here we had Howden Power, who had supplied these spares previously, and they did so under a license agreement with Balke Deal, um, a German company. But that, um, that agreement between the two then expired. So we wanted to see if, and, and uh, Howden then did not have the IP, the intellectual property, and nobody else uh, did have it. But we wanted to, to, to then go to a limited market to see if we can induce, we could induce some competition between Balkata, who had this uh, IP, and also Howden, who could possibly uh, reverse engineer some of the work that, has, uh, that was required. So National Treasury then did not support that, um, and they asked us to investigate the conduct of Howden for supplying the spares, uh, although they did not have the license, they had just an agreement. And the National Treasury also said, we must ensure that only service providers who have the required license and are accredited by the OEMs for spares um, are used to supply spares. So while we were reviewing what National Treasury had, uh, had told us to do, we were informed um, that uh, Howden and Balkat had, uh, they, they had matched. Um, and so at, at this stage, with uh, Howden actually acquiring uh, Balkat, uh, which came into effect in January of uh, this year. So this, uh, what had been requested is no longer required. So we are now in the process of uh, writing a report to National Treasury so that we can close out this, uh, this request. So Jay, the reason was uh, IP, which was not uh, readily available out in the market or was not available in the market. And that was the reason for this request set deviation. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Philip. Please move on, Natasha. 
Thank you. Uh, our group executive in charge of capital, Becky and Kumalo. Please deal with this one, Becky. Thank you, Andre. Good morning, Honorable Chair, Honorable Ministers, and Honorable Members. Uh, this was uh, the request for a single source for the environmental uh, control officers for one of the projects that we are doing uh, in one of the power stations at Camden. Uh, the reason uh, was that this uh, company is there as part of the requirements of the license that we must have such a company to monitor the environmental sensitive projects. So they were part of the projects uh, earlier on. And then what happened then, uh, Chair, what I need to state here that the contract on these services, it was a panel contract. They were uh, a panel was a panel, actually the, the, the contract did not expire per se. It was a task order that uh, expired within the broader contract. So the team just wanted to ensure continuity because we were having some challenges with the, the ash dams at Camden. So that we use the same company that has been with the team uh, for some time. And then that was not uh, supported by national treasury. But like I said, because this was, uh, there was a contract so we couldn't go out actually to the market. We then had to go back to the panel and source the, the different suppliers. So obviously then with the new supplier, there is some delays that get introduced into the uh, the projects, but the, it, it was a, a task order within the, the national contract that expired uh, actually, but the contract itself in terms of the panel of contractors was not expiring. So the team just wanted to, to ensure that they continue with uh, the service provider that was already on site. Chair. So, so we, we've closed that by then going in and uh, inducting one of the other companies within the, the panel that was there on the national contract. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Next slide, please. Keep on going. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, this one is also at uh, the Camden within the same uh, infrastructure, the construction of the new HDM. So what happened there, we, we had this company, uh, WBHO, that was already in the work and another company that was doing some other work that supported the, the dam, uh, couldn't finish the, the work. So then what the team uh, tried to do was to get all the other work that was uh, supposed to be done by this other company to be incorporated into this one contract just to, to save time because at that time as well, we were already sitting with the risk of uh, Camden Power Station shutting down because of the Asian space that was not there. So that was then uh, not supported that we can uh, incorporate other scopes to, to this contract. We needed to go to the, to the market, which then uh, we have done that. Uh, uh, we're currently uh, finalizing that scope now uh, from the competitive market for the remainder of the scopes. And then the plan is to award that contract uh, by the beginning of uh, April chair. So, so the, the team was trying to, to avoid these delays on that one, as we've seen that we had to also reduce the output of Camden as well, because of some of these delays that we experienced because of this uh, process. Here we had the contractor as well that had to be uh, removed from the project for some of the other uh, issues that we had with them. So that contract had to be canceled and then we needed to try and incorporate their scope to this uh, other company, which was not supported uh, that deviation. So we had to still go out onto the market. Hence, we are only finalizing that process now, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's please move on now to uh, some of our call uh, requests. I'm going to ask Snell Nagar, who heads up our primary energy part of the business, to deal with uh, the following two slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to the Honorable Minister and members and um, everyone present at this meeting. With regards to this particular deviation, um, we ESCOM sought approval to negotiate a once of agreement with. Uh, Makoya Supply Chain, which is located in the Highfelt Industrial Park. 
The motivation was to offload 26,000 tons of coal loaded on six trains and various parts of the network. The, the reason for this is the, the, the Tipler incline conveyor structure at uh, Majuba Power Station uh, burned and the silo at Majuba uh, collapsed and was damaged. And so the trains could not be offloaded at Majuba Power Station. This is where we had already loaded the trains from, from mines that supply coal on rail. So there are only three rail sidings in South Africa with rotary Tipler facilities. It's the Highfield Industrial Park, it's your Richards Bay Coal Terminal, and it's Majuba Power Station. Highfield Industrial Park is closer to Majuba Power Station than the RBCT. So National Treasury uh, did not support and requested a closed bid be, uh, be conducted for supplies in the Highfield Industrial Park. Um, ESCOM complied to this, but only Makoya eventually tendered, and the contract was then awarded to them. Thanks, Chair. We'll go to the next one. Chairperson, on this particular deviation, it's a deviation to negotiate a coal supply with, uh, with a single source, South 32. Um, there is a long-term coal contract um, to supply coal to Duba Power Station from the adjacent colliery. In June 2019, South 32, who's the owner of that particular colliery, declared hardship on the Duba Coal Supply Agreement. Um, ESCOM appointed consultants to verify this hardship claim. ESCOM's consultants had verified that there is financial distress at that mine, but not hardship per the definition of the contract. This is important because if there was a valid hardship claim, then, then this hardship could have been resolved within the construct of the existing agreement, and that contemplated within the hardship clause. But but ESCOM's view was slightly different and that we, we agreed via our consultants that there was definitely financial distress and, and that had to be resolved, but there was not hardship as per the, per the agreement. So the thinking chair, chairperson at that point in time was that we would look to renegotiate a coal supply agreement with South 32 or 10 million tons per annum, which is the existing coal supply agreement for the next 14 years, which is the life of Duva Power Station. And, and importantly, this was per the guidance of our consultants as well, because there are some legacy issues in the existing agreements that we wanted to distance ourselves from. So ESCOM therefore applied to National Treasury, National Treasury to renegotiate the contract, and hence the, requ the request to deviate from open tender. Um, ESCOM made this application on the 23rd of July and, and NT rejected this on the 19th of October. And that is the basis of the 67 billion application uh, in front of you. Just important to note that post the application and the rejection of National Treasury, there are further developments on this transaction, which, which you will potentially see in the future. Um, just to give you some color on that, uh, South 32 have notified ESCOM of either either selling this to, to the Bong PTY Limited or going to business rescue if they can't find a solution for this mine because they are in financial distress. And after discussions with South 32, it appears that there is potentially a business case to mine this resource uh, economically for ESCOM for the next four years. And thereafter that there is a substantial amount of capital that's required which and, and, and the unit cost of mining this coal increases substantially. So ESCOM is thus presenting this case uh, within the, the governance structures and ESCOM will make another application to National Treasury based on this approved business case. Um, it's just important to also note that ESCOM has gone out on RFP for uh, the longer term uh, cold supply solution for, for Duva. And this will inform ESCOM's long term cold supply solution for Duva Power Station. Thank you, Chair. No. Ridevan, our chief uh, nuclear officer, will deal with uh, this particular slide on nuclear. Good morning, uh, all. And uh, so, so the item re related to um, the nuclear area 
we like to uh, request to, to solicit services um, from a single source for the transfer of all generator and transformer protection to a new digital system with uh, ABB. Um, and the reason for the, the deviation was that uh, ABB South Africa is the preferred supplier for and, and service provider because of the existing engineering infrastructure at the, at the power station. So the previous system or the current system is, is also ABB supplied. Um, the feedback from, from National Treasury indicated not supported and recommended uh, or indicated that uh, a market analysis report needs to be provided. Um, and uh, that includes all accredited service providers. Um, further analysis was then done. Um, and it was confirmed that ABB is the OEM as per the ESCOM generation standard and, and as applied at, at, uh, at various other power stations where ABB is also then uh, the, the OEM for, for this generator and turbine protection uh, equipment. Um, and basically that supports that uh, we go with ABB as the, as the OEM. We've currently um, awaiting an, an offer from, from, from ABB. However, what we, we have asked is that uh, that gets put on hold for, for a period of time until we get uh, feedback sent to National Treasury just to confirm the, the latest status on this. Thank you very much, uh, Rudevan. Um, let's now move on to um, expansions, please. Becky. Okay, thank you, Andre. Honorable Chair, this one was the, the expansion for Nitupi on the civil contract. I think it's been one of the difficult uh, contract as well in the civil because of a uh, lot of changes that has happened on that uh, space. Uh, primarily, initially, it was informed by the uh, geographic. Uh, your technical studies of the, the plant that had to be changed as well. So there has been some numerous designs. So, but this last uh, expansion chair was uh, from that value of 9.5 billion to increase it to, uh, by 100 and, uh, 220 uh, million. It was just more the, the an issue of dealing with uh, one of the contractors as well. The team here wanted to incorporate the, the engineering contract that is there to, to supervise the, the, the civil construction that had uh, expired. So they tried to bring that and also to deal with the uh, uh, preliminaries and generals uh, increases on this contract because of the uh, delays as well and some of the time extension for the contractor. So civil is one of the contracts as well that we, we also had to, to stop when the, the lockdown started. So there were time claims from the, the contractors that we had to deal with as well. So that was then not uh, supported by the National Treasury. And also the other point they've raised there that they do not support the unknown scope, I think it was the incorrect term that uh, our team used there. This was supposed to be for contingencies uh, on the contracts because of the, in the civil space, there's a lot of uh, changes now that uh, result from other, either other contractors or from the scope changes that sometimes becomes uh, not uh, quantifiable. So, so because of that, then it was not uh, supported by National Treasury. So what we have then done, we have then suspended the contract from the beginning of November, but we couldn't uh, cancel this contract immediately, Chairperson, because uh, the type of contract that we, uh, is a please is, is the FIDIC type of a contract, where even when the contract is stopped, we, you need to allow the contractor to finalize what they were busy with or engage with them in a cancellation process, because if we don't do that, then they can uh, interdict any process to try and 
get the uh, new uh, supplier. So we are in that process now with the, the contractor. We are finalizing the negotiation and they also had to try and complete as much as possible of what was on their scope. And then we are then, uh, once we finalize this one, which is planned to this month because of the builders break as well between December. So there was some of that delay as well. So we will then close this and then uh, go out with the new scope to get the other suppliers to finalize the, the rest of the civil scopes that were still remaining on this uh, contract chair. Thank you. Okay, Chair, this one uh, at Kusile, it's a, a running contract. This contract was for the supply of transformers by this company, Actom, at Kusile. They needed to supply uh, 13 transformers, which was ordered, and then uh, and then they would then come in and commission them after they've been installed. So, so what happened here, Chair, we were requesting the term extension on the contract because from the contractual obligation point of view, uh, as ESCOM, we were, this contractor was entitled to time that uh, because the delay was not caused by them, it was caused by the other contractors, especially also the, the civil contractors. So then from contractually, we have given this contractor uh, the time because it was not their fault, the, the delays. So what we have done, then we have penalized the companies that has caused the delay, especially the, the civil contractors. We have uh, uh, imposed the delay damages to the tune of 190 million on them, which was the maximum allowed by the contract. So that penalty has been imposed onto the uh, civil contractors, and but this company then, because they are they are they are on schedule with the, their transformers, they didn't cause the delay, so we, we couldn't. Uh, hence, we were asking for for this time for them as well. So most of the units, uh, these transformers have been installed, but they still need to come and do the installation on unit five and six and commissioning. I mean, uh, chair. The risk with this one, if we don't do that and cancel this contract, because the transformers are high risk plant, if we get someone else to energize the new transformer and it blew up, then it means ESCOM would have lost the, the guarantees and then we would have to pay the cost of that. So instead of holding this contractor to, to, to their product as well. So that, that is the, the issue on this one, Chair. We are only looking for time to allow them to come back and commission the, the rest of the contract of the transformers on the last two units at Gusile Chair. Thank you. If I move on then uh, to the next one. I think the, the, this, this one and the next one Chair, they are the same. I think it's uh, again, it was more the confusion on this one because uh, the, the, the these task orders, again, it's a task order within a five-year contract, but the team had a 12 month uh, of that. So then they, what they were trying to do, uh, because there were some few months left for them to finish the work. So they tried to get this task order to be extended for about three months to finish the, the outstanding work as we had some delays last year as well with all the lockdowns and on those, all of that. So, but unfortunately it was not supported. So, and then what we've also, uh, the team used for, for this one was to try and uh, because of some of the team opening uh, scope within the ESCOM resources. So some of the uh, engineering teams were asked to, 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 fill up, to fill some of the gaps on this contract while they were looking for alternatives. And then also the same thing on the next one, the, the, the contract for the, the, this health and safety and environmental resources, it's a, it's a national contract at head office. It was still uh, available. So we just needed to, instead of continuing with uh, this uh, contract, we had to then go back to the 
to the panel as well to get these resources. But the, the, the issue here, the team was just trying to get the people that were already on the work to, to try and finish for those three months that was remaining, but then that was not supported. So it's something that we have now uh, internally uh, created a process in terms of how we deal with the, the task orders and also orientated the new task order company that will come in in time before uh, rather than to try, but it just was because of the time that was left. You know, it was to give someone else a two months contract becomes a bit uh, unfair. So, so that was what the team was trying to do on this one, Chair. But then we had to stop those uh, services and then uh, go and get some services from the panel as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. Philip, please. Um, Honorable Minister, members and, uh, and Chair. So th this one, it was for an existing contract and this contract was due to expire in June of, uh, of uh, 2020. And National Treasury was then um, approached um, after the, the contract had, had expired to see if uh, we could extend this. The reason for that, uh, Chair, is um, national lockdown came before the work that was uh, under this contract could be completed. So the work was not completed. So there was a request then to extend the time. This was a time extension of, uh, of uh, three months. Um, that was not approved because National Treasury has a, indicated they could not approve a contract that had already expired. So they could not approve to retrospectively. Uh, in retrospect, Chair, it's uh, clear that we should not have made this, uh, this application. I think the thinking of that at the time was that it's under extraordinary circumstances because of national lockdown, and so the work would continue afterwards. So this was then not uh, approved and the contract uh, expired, and uh, we started a new process. A contract was uh, placed, I think it was placed in, uh, in February, so this, this was not continued with in line with uh, National Treasury um, um, direction. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Philip. Uh, we will now request Sukhamotsu Skippers, who is the Group Executive in charge of our transmission business, to deal with the next number of slides. Uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, Honorable Minister, Honorable Chairman, Honorable Members, good morning to you. Um, this transaction relates to um, software that is used in uh, ESCOM Aviation. Uh, members may be aware that ESCOM has a number of uh, helicopters that are used in uh, uh, operations and maintenance. And uh, the scheduling uh, and operations of this fleet is uh, run through a software that uh, is called SoftMax. Um, this contract was initially put uh, uh, on a single source basis uh, in 2016 and approved by National Treasury. Uh, and then when it was due to expire in April of 2020, uh, National Treasury was again approved to approve uh, the contract. Uh, this was not supported um, and there was a direction that has gone to and test the market. Uh, this was subsequently done um, and uh, the uh, new contract uh, has subsequently been placed. Uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, with regard to uh, this uh, transaction, uh, which relates to the provision of civil works uh, at the transmission substations and Merensky and um, there was a request uh, to National Treasury to approve an expansion uh, of the contract. Um, this was um, uh, because of uh, both time and cost uh, increases, uh, which were largely as a result of uh, network constraints, which led to uh, outages not being available and as such, uh, the work was delayed uh, and uh, some of the scope uh, also increased. Uh, part of what 
transpired in this case is that uh, when National Treasury was approved, they indicated that sorry, this was sorry, now. Sorry, sorry uh, Mr. Kassim, we are losing you. Uh, members can't hear now. <clears throat> Uh, apologies, uh, Chairman. I hope this is better. May I proceed, uh, Honorable Chairman? Yes, yes, you, you may proceed, yes. All right, thank you very much. Uh, apologies for the poor sound. Um, in this case, um, the contract had been expanded on two occasions, uh, and in the first occasion, it was not meted to surgery, uh, and this was one of a number contracts uh, that had uh, been uh, uh, not compliant uh, with one of the National Treasury instruction notes, uh, where the question was when you have uh, either an increase or an increase uh, and an increase is for the end or rule. Uh, and this was a systemic uh, misinterpretation of the policy. And this was one of the transactions uh, that was um, uh, found to not be uh, compliant. Um, so we have subsequently uh, proceeded to uh, invoke a condonation process uh, in that fashion that the, the report uh, did not comply. Um, however, with specific reference to the work that needed to be done, uh, we have tested the market and we have concluded. Hello, Mr. The Rater. Uh, apologies, Chair. It seems I think, that uh, I, think, I think members can't hear, particularly on the non-compliance. Uh, that portion, you'll have to re-summarize it somewhere because I think members have missed that uh, portion, important portion. Apologies, uh, Chair. Um, Sihamotsu, maybe if you can um, adjust your microphone and. Uh, start again from non-compliance and uh, address the committee again, please. Uh, thank you, Andre, and apologies for that. Um, can I just confirm if I'm audible now, Andre? Yes, you are audible. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, so what we are saying here, Chairman, is that uh, there was a number of modifications that were needed on this contract. Uh, the first modification was approved internally, and the second one, the National Treasury was approached to approve the modification or the expansion, at which point National Treasury uh, pointed out that the first modification should have also uh, been tabled to National Treasury, which is correct. Uh, in this case, uh, there was a, a, a number of uh, contracts that had not complied with the National Treasury Instruction Notes and a bulk condonation request was submitted to the National Treasury in 2019. Um, so when this one was picked up, it had already been part of an initial uh, bulk request for condonation of trans uh, transactions that were not complying with one of the National Treasury Instruction Notes. Uh, regarding the remainder of the work, the uh, Treasury had indicated that it must test the market, and this was done uh, through a panel of contractors for civil works, and uh, a contract has been awarded to conclude the remaining scope of work. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chairman, if I may proceed to this uh, next transaction, uh, which relates to work uh, being done at the Tromsberg transmission substation, uh, which was work to uh, construct a terrace uh, to allow for the connection of uh, new entities uh, to the network. Um, Chairman, what has in this case is that uh, during the execution of the work, there was a dispute. Oh, we, we completely can't hear now uh, this part of the presentation. Uh, uh, it has to be elevated somewhere, somehow, uh, as you sum up, Mr. Reuters. Uh, yes, uh, Honorable Chair, apologies for the poor sound quality. Um, 
perhaps I can uh, take over and then Mr. Skippers can supplement. Um, so the, uh, as, as Mr. Skippers was saying, this was um, a project for the construction of a new substation to enable IPP integration. Um, we uh, requested an expansion in order to implement a contract adjudicator's decision award in favor of the contractor and a national treasury conditionally approved uh, the uh, request. Uh, and again, we are now taking the matter to arbitration. And once it's finalized, we will uh, report back to National Treasury uh, in order to ensure that we conduct this in a compliant manner. Next slide, please. Um, this, uh, this request was for uh, legal services uh, for a transmission line. Uh, we had expanded or sought to uh, obtain approval for the expansion uh, in order to continue with the provision of legal services uh, as the legal process had not uh, found its uh, way to a conclusion. National Treasury did not approve this and we are therefore um, pursuing a different procurement mechanism in order to access legal services uh, so that we can see this transaction to completion. Uh, it is um, fair to point out in this instance that the expansion requested was uh, for time, so therefore not additional funds required, and um, we were therefore instructed by National Treasury to um, essentially close off this uh, particular contract and again approach the, the market, which uh, may create some um, continuity issues with our legal advice. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, Chair, um, with your permission, um, since these are conditionally supported deviations and in the interests of time, uh, if we may uh, beg your indulgence to um, take these slides as read, uh, we are guided by you. If you want us to take each slide individually, then we will do so. But these are uh, deviations that were in fact supported by National Treasury, albeit with some conditions. So they are uh, not likely to be controversial with respect, Chair. No, you, you, you may proceed. Uh, I will check it around quarter past 10. Uh, how far are you? <clears throat> so should we, should we go through each individual slide, Chair? As I was saying at the beginning, you just manage your information as to how you present it, but I will just allocate time. But where you 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 decide as 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 you are making your presentation that it's sufficient. But yeah. Right. Thank you, uh, Honourable Chair. Let's then uh, proceed, please, Natasha, to the next slide. Uh, Snell, if I can request you to uh, go through this, please only focus on the key points. Uh, there's, um, I think, for the reasons that I mentioned, uh, unless there are questions from the honorable members, let's focus on the key issues and uh, rather not uh, go into an elaborate explanation. Snell, please. Thank you, Andre. Um, I will do both these things together. They, they are similar. So uh, basically, there is a long-term cost plus tight quality adjacent to uh, these three power stations that are considered in both of those two points. Uh, the, the mines supply coal to those power stations by a conveyor belt. The, the existing contracts are, were for 40-year coal supply agreements, but the power stations were extended, the life of the power stations were extended for 10 more years. So there is a mismatch between the power, the power station life and the adjacent mine's life. So the power station needs coal for another 10 years at the end of those lives. These are 
This is the period beyond 2030, from 2030 to 2040, 2044, depending on which power station you're talking about. That's the life I'm talking about. So uh, we made an application. On the, on the first one, NT recommended that we, uh, that we, uh, that, that they will conduct an independent assessment and, and then, uh, and, and then, um, decide on, on, on them, on their way forward. And ESCOM's waiting the NT's decision. Um, on, on the second one, um, ESCOM, uh, NT supported the deviation request on the basis that uh, the reasonability, that there's a reasonability on the price and that no potential suppliers are disadvantaged. Um, ESCOM has issued RFIs for the Tavo power station and will and will follow that up with a RFP in the future. And <coughs> the Yuka power station, ESCOM has already issued an RFP. So uh, chairperson on both of these um, uh, on both of these items, ESCOM will in principle test the market in addition to the above mentioned process that was uh, sought from the National Treasury. Thank you, Andre. Thank you very much. If we then move on to the next one, uh, I will just uh, very quickly uh, go through this. Um, it was uh, an application for the removal of scrap steel. Um, and uh, the purpose of the application was for continuation of service and National Treasury supported it with uh, certain conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, um, we had a, a request to uh, expand um, services provided by HKA, uh, specialists in contractual claims who have been assisting us at uh, Kusile. And again, conditional approval was uh, provided by National Treasury. Uh, similarly, uh, we uh, leased property at Cater Ridge Site Camp. Um, again, the, uh, there were certain materials that uh, had been abandoned and then um, rental was uh, required to continue to be paid. And again, National Treasury supported this particular deviation with uh, some appropriate conditions. Next one. Uh, on this one, um, this is in the information uh, systems environment. Uh, and again, approval was granted uh, subject to the conclusion of a competitive bidding process uh, and that the deviation does not regularize any irregularities. Uh, similarly, um, an expansion or a deviation rather to extend the contract for a period of three years um, provided that ESCOM finalizes a request for information process and inform National Treasury of the outcome. Next one. Same one. Um, again, um, a request to uh, solicit services from a single source uh, in order to retain a warranty and uh, approved by National Treasury on condition that it's cost effective. We also uh, extended a uh, lease, and again, just with the requirement that the rental should be market related and that the market is, is tested within a period of 54 months. So supported by National Treasury. Next one. Um, supply of uh, lubricants. Um, and uh, this is an important uh, approach that we can uh, conclude with certain nominated suppliers uh, due to our uh, lack of lubricants compatibility testing capacity. Uh, this was supported uh, by National Treasury and uh, on condition that we complete the process to uh, obtain our own compatibility testing capability and then uh, reissue the standard to the market prior to the three-year expiry uh, of the contract period. Um, the last one there is for the um, high-frequency power supply units. Um, this was for an expansion of scope and time, and again, conditionally supported by National Treasury, uh, that we do not uh, allow any other 
contractors to be disadvantaged. Next slide, please. We now move to conditionally supported expansions. Next slide. Uh, the uh, wet, uh, wet flue gas desulfurization plant. Um, this is a contract with uh, Alstom and again supported based on uh, a requirement to be reasonable uh, and expansion of uh, scope for construction of miscellaneous structures at Kusile. Uh, Eskom was requested to provide uh, certain feedback um, to National Treasury. So that is an ongoing open matter. Uh, again, if we look at um, coal that was uh, required to be supplied, uh, supported, uh, provided that uh, certain documentation be provided to National Treasury in order to ensure that it is cost competitive. Next slide. Uh, control and instrumentation with Siemens. Um, again, in order to ensure that there is continuation of service uh, with the uh, original equipment manufacturer. And again, supported by National Treasury uh, with requests to investigate and interrogate the uh, variation orders to ensure that no abuse uh, had taken place and that action must be implemented against officials who cause delays as this is considered to be fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Uh, some further technical requirements and we will submit this to National Treasury. Next slide. Uh, if we then turn to the turbine generator uh, at uh, Madupi power station, again, supported by uh, National Treasury subject to uh, certain conditions with which we will uh, comply. Uh, so again, uh, we, we have received approval with those conditions. Next one. Uh, boiler works with Mitsubishi Itachi. Uh, this is a sole supplier, uh, the OEM and uh, again supported with requests for verifications uh, and that um, costs incurred for access to site um, should confirm to be not as a result of uh, poor planning or delays in access to sites. The, um, again, the expansion of um, the HKA property, uh, properties joint venture um, this is uh, similar to the previous HKA uh, request. Again, uh, supported just with the requirement that we verify hours and uh, rates as well as the actual work to be done. Next one. Um, again, a number of um, expansions that were uh, supported uh, in order to uh, provide maintenance and repair for high voltage oil filled and XLPE cables. Uh, it was supported for a period of 12 months only. Uh, the provision of a panel of electrical contractors in order to ensure continuation of service. Prov uh, what it was supported on condition that the cost implications are market related. Uh, legal services, uh, again, continuation of service and uh, approved with the uh, prerequisite that we have to ask our internal auditors to review costs uh, on electrical contracts to allow for the establishment of a new contractor panel. Uh, this was supported for a period up to the 31st of October. Um, with a requirement that the new panel be established before that date. Uh, SPU metering reading service, again, a panel um, was appointed, uh, insufficient funds, um, and accordingly, National Treasury that uh, supported the extension to the end of April of this year, 
and we were required to ensure that the activities required to support the revised strategy would be realized. Next one. Uh, security services. Uh, there has been an increase in the demand for security services, uh, and this was approved by National Treasury with the requirement that we must ensure that the reasonable of the price be assessed. Uh, stringing and cabling at uh, two uh, substations, uh, again supported uh, in order to expand for time and uh, a requirement that the correct threshold was should be applied. Next one. Uh, the request for approval to modify um, contract for supply of coal. Uh, this was supported, um, so certain information was required to be supplied, uh, and that that was in fact done. Expansion request again. This is for uh, the supply of coal to Duva, which Mr. Snell Nagar dealt with earlier, and an extension period uh, of nine months was supported on a conditional basis. Okay, next one. From a business continuity perspective, uh, supply of coal to Kusile, uh, again, conditionally supported and the uh, certain request for information. Uh, and this was, um, this was done uh, in accordance with the requirement. Um, there was a request to extend the appointment of a firm of attorneys to do uh, certain legal work on a a transaction involving South 32, uh, and this was approved, uh, and it was made clear that the uh, procurement process uh, on an urgent basis was justified and uh, not in contravention of procurement prescripts. Okay, next slide. Uh, again, uh, Oil and lubricants, um, I think we, we have dealt with a similar one before, conditionally approved. This one. Uh, Honorable Chair, uh, we are engaging on a monthly basis with National Treasury uh, to ensure that uh, we can uh, expedite and streamline the approval processes. Uh, we have regular meetings that take place. Uh, we have in keeping with the uh, process of divisionalization and ultimately legal separation, finalized the appointment of uh, divisional procurement leads, and they are henceforth tasked with the uh, responsibility to monitor compliance. And this will be done uh, henceforth at a divisional level. Obviously, there will be oversight at an ESCOM holdings level, we have reconciled the various uh, registers of applications, and we are providing regular feedback to both the uh, EXCO as well as to the holdings board. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. If we now move to uh, coal contract renegotiations, Uh, Snell, if I can ask you to please be as brief as possible to respect the time of the committee. Only focus on the key points. The members have had access to the slides and uh, they definitely have read it. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Will be. In FY 2019, ESCOM concluded a number of contracts through an emergency procurement program and an urgent procurement program due to the shortages of coal. Thereafter, ESCOM did a bottom-up analysis and, and, if I can stress, an internal analysis of all of our short, medium-term coal contracts where we, where we looked at what is the cost base of what we think is the cost base of those particular contracts versus the price we concluded those coal contracts at. There were seven suppliers that we thought were making above or making a higher quality profit than other suppliers. 
ESCOM approached those seven suppliers to renegotiate their coal supply contracts. And there were two reasons why. So ESCOM was unsuccessful in renegotiating those seven contracts. And there were two big reasons why ESCOM could not renegotiate them. The first one was um, some of the suppliers wanted to negotiate on a portfolio basis. So they wanted an increase in the cheaper contracts for a, for a reduction in this particular contract. On a, and on a net-net basis, this was net negative for ESCOM. And other suppliers wanted a higher increase in their delivery profile, meaning their supply volumes to ESCOM, or they, they the, the overall volume of the contract to be increased. And that again, on a calculation basis, was net negative to ESCOM. So Chairperson or Andre, the, the principal reasons for ESCOM being unsuccessful were those two, and ESCOM was unsuccessful in negotiating the coal prices of these seven agreements. Thank you. Andre, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on then. Update on Madubi and Kusili construction. If I can ask uh, Becky and Kumalo to please address these. Thank you, Becky. Okay, thank you, Andre. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. I think. Uh, this slide uh, talks to the uh, progress that has been made uh, in these two, two mega projects. We uh, do we've got now five units uh, in commercial operation. We're busy with uh, the last unit, which is unit one. So we're currently busy with the final commissioning on that unit to, to meet the date uh, as shown in there. And then for Usile Chair, uh, unit three, we're also busy with the final uh, Great compliance test. So the plan is to finish it uh, by the, the, the during this month still chair to take that unit into commercial operation and then we will be left with the three dates as approved by the boards that we are still focusing to 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 to, to keep this unit on. In terms of the cost chair, we still staying with the budget as was approved by the board in 2015. So for Midupi, uh, we are still projecting that we will still finish within the approved budget of 145 billion. And then for Usile, uh, the 161.4 billion uh, chair. So, so those are the figures that in terms of the budget, uh, we have not changed them since uh, 2015 and we're still working towards meeting that and uh, trying to save as far as we can as well, chairs. Move on to the next slide. Uh, Chair, this slide is just the same slide. It's just giving the similar information, just take, showing the megawatts that are still to be commissioned, which is 4,000. So uh, then what has been done since the start of the build program in 2005, 13,000 uh, megawatts. Thanks, uh, Natasha. You can move on to the next one. Chair, just to touch on the uh, defects at uh, on the build program at uh, Midopi, uh, we have indicated previously that uh, the, the, the air cleaning uh, system is one of the, and the males and the air heaters. So we are busy with those uh, defects. We started at uh, Midopi last year. We started with uh, unit three. And then uh, unit three has been running now. It's almost going to finish the year now after it was the first unit where we've done the modification together with the contractor still done on a 50-50 split, and then the, the DAB process then will start after that. So Midupi, we have finished uh, uh, now uh, five units. If you move to the next slide, uh, Natasha. In terms of the defects corrections, we have finished uh, five units at Midupi. We are busy with uh, unit five now, which is the, the last unit that outage has started. So we have seen some uh, uh, improvement uh, at Midupi in terms of these modifications that we have done. Kusile, uh, the units that are still under construction, four, five, and six, we will come back, we will come on with uh, these modifications, and then uh, unit one, two, and three 
applying to start uh, from uh, mid this year with unit one and then the other two will follow from that uh, uh, chair. So the pro program of uh, repairing or addressing these uh, major defects is uh, progressing as planned. So we're doing the last unit at Midupi and then Kusile, we are busy on the unit that are still under construction. Uh, next slide, uh, Natasha. Okay, uh, Andre, can I move on? We, we can move, I think I'm done, Andre, thanks. Thank you very much. Let's now move on to the recovery of overpayments at um, Kusilia Madupi, as well as other uh, contracts. If I can ask our acting um, group executive for legal and compliance, Ms. Narina Otto, to please take us through uh, these six slides. Thank you, Group Executive. Uh, good morning to the members of the committee. We have made progress with our recoveries emanating from corruption and malfeasance, as well as irregularities. In 2018, Eskom recovered an amount of about 1 billion from McKinsey. March 2020, 171 million from Deloitte. Miagra, we recruit 3 million of 35 million and we are pursuing the balance. The owner of Miagra and a former Eskom employee are actually currently facing 53 counts of fraud and theft. We are happy to present to the committee that in December 2020, we recovered an amount of 1.5 billion from ABB. We are making <clears throat> steady progress regarding other recoveries as well. We have pursued civil action against a number of former Eskom executives to recover large sums of money lost as a result of state capture, combined summons <clears throat> in the amount of 3.4 billion was issued last year. We are pursuing claims against seven former Eskom executives based on breach of fiduciary duties and contract. Thank you. Next slide. Tenova Mining and Minerals. Um, Tenova initiated DAB proceedings against Eskom as a result of the engineer's rejection of certain claims and are claiming an additional amount of 339 million above the 1.1 billion that has already been paid. Um, Eskom is opposing this. The DAB will entertain certain preliminary defenses first and the SIU is investigating the directors of the company on the basis that they colluded with certain Eskom personnel through third party contractors. On the tubular construction matter, Tubular submitted certain claims against Eskom in the amount of approximately 240 million. We have posed this claim successfully at DAB. They've notified dissatisfaction. The SIU is currently investigating. The NPA has also charged tubular directors and ex Eskom employees with various fraud and corruption charges. And once further information is available, we'll consider the option of proceeding with a review application to have the contract itself set aside. Um, tubular has since been placed in liquidation. So this may affect any claim to which in Eskom is entitled. Next slide, please. Trillion, Eskom instituted action against Trillion to recover payment of approximately 600 million on the pretext that Trillion was a supply development localization partner to McKinsey. Judgment was awarded in favor of Eskom, but we did not receive payment. Eskom since launched liquidation proceedings against Trillion. Liquidators have been appointed and they're working with SARS. SARS has intervened in the application on behalf of SA Inc. Um, one of the issues that needs to be considered is the actual amount that is in the pot that is available and whether on a cost benefit basis um, Eskom should actually proceed with this, but discussions are taking place. On the PwC matter, we issued a letter of demand to PwC last year demanding repayment of the sum of 95 million that was unlawfully paid to PwC. They were contracted on a risk-based contract to realize CAPEX savings in our generation projects. We've since established from SAP downloads that the amount is 108 million and the court papers will be issued and served shortly for claiming this money back from PwC. Next slide, please. On the Stefanuti stocks, Basil Reed matter regarding an estimated overpayment of 1 billion, 
uh, SSB are putting claims for additional P's and G's due to certain um, matters. They were not substantiated as required by the contract. We've made interim payments in the meantime without requisite substantiation on the basis that there would be an overall settlement agreement concluded, but there was no consistency or verification um, of the monthly payments. They varied between 15 million to 50 million per month. No settlement agreement was reached. The new project director stopped the interim payments and then SSBR referred this non-payment to DAB, which is the Dispute Adjudication Board. Eskim apologies, successfully defended the adjudication and we are now in discussions um, about the process to de determine the actual claim entitlement. During on the P28, package 28, during the execution of the contract, certain compensation events were agreed and paid without financial measurements being done. The contractor submitted various deemed compensation events, and these disputes are currently in adjudication. Next slide, please. On the Impulse International ma uh, matter, two summons were served by Impulse, one against ERI, Rotec Industries, and one against Eskim. We are opposing the actions. We've also made application requesting the court to grant an order declaring these contracts unlawful and void ab initio and the contracts be set aside. Eskim is also requesting the court to order that it be reimbursed for all payments made subsequent to these contracts. Next slide, please. Eskim is involved in litigation with Econ Oil. This has been the subject of several news reports recently. In December 2020, Bowman Gilfill and attorneys provided Eskim with a report on the quantification of overcharging by Econ in an amount of approximately 1.2 billion over a five year period. We instituted arbitration proceedings against Econ Oil through AFSA to recover the sum. Econ Oil has not yet complied with the AFSA rules to the extent that they do not, the arbitration will still proceed uh, with Eskom being the party that presents evidence to the arbitrator on the basis of which a determination will be made. The second matter involves Bid Corp 4786. It regards the validity of a contract for fuel oil between Eskom and Econ Oil. There were two other parties involved, being FFS and Sassol. In an adjudication proceeding last year, the adjudicator found that a valid contract existed. Eskom has referred that to arbitration on the basis that we deny that a contract was concluded. We've also filed an application before the High Court to stay those dispute resolution proceedings in terms of the NEC3 process, and also to obtain an order declaring that Eskom did not enter into the contract to the extent that the court finds that it did enter into a contract, then to set aside that contract. Um, at present, it's only Econ Oil that is opposing these review proceedings. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, honorable members. Thank you very much um, to Narina. Next slide, please. Um, Caleb, if I can ask you to please deal with uh, this, this regulatory matter. Yeah, uh, thanks, honorable members. Uh, Eskom firstly welcomes the additional generation capacity that will be supplied by private companies. And uh, this has been ongoing for a while. and and allows for municipalities to purchase directly from IPPs. Uh, we still need to understand our involvement in particular with regard to backup power during winter and peaks. And there would be a need to address the tariff structures going forward. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, Tasha, I think the three areas uh, as I've highlighted that we so a lot of work that needs to be done uh, is number one, to establish a new overall market framework that has very uh, clear assignment of technical and economic accountabilities between the various parties, municipalities and IPPs. Uh, to, as I mentioned, we need to look at restructuring the current uh, ISCM tariffs. Uh, 
obviously with the support and approval through the regulator, and it would be a need to deal with an appropriate subsidy framework between the different classes of electricity consumers. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Caleb. If we can now move on to the controversial Volga residential project. Uh, Becky, if I can ask you to please go through this one. Becky, if you are talking, you are on mute. Right, Chair, it seems that we may have lost Mr. Nkumalo in the interest of time. Um, I will uh, take us through this one. Um, so this project was undertaken in 2012 to accommodate um, artisans and uh, contractors during the construction of Kusile. Uh, the initial uh, contract was awarded for an amount of uh, over 260 million. Uh, we have uh, to date incurred costs of 632 million uh, and a further 207 million uh, on common infrastructure and related uh, work. Uh, on the 4th of August 2017, uh, the board tender committee uh, resolved that um, ESCOM should uh, terminate the contract with the construction company concerned. Uh, this was done. Uh, and in December 2019, uh, the executive committee approved a strategy not to continue with the construction of the Volcher residential project and approved that uh, we may start to sell this block of flats. Uh, we are in discussions with um, uh, various departments um, in order to ensure that we can utilize this uh, block of flats for the best possible purpose, in particular with the Department of Human Settlements. And we are currently engaged in a due diligence process. Uh, as a consequence of this uh, regrettable project, uh, ESCOM has declared 840 million Rand as fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Uh, Jared Bears pointing out that uh, this project was undertaken and carried out at the height of the state capture period. Next slide, please. This is just to give uh, members a, uh, an aerial view. Uh, it is a uh, very well-built uh, block of flats, in fact, several blocks, uh, very well equipped. Uh, and it is, again, uh, highly regrettable that we uh, have in fact, never occupied uh, any of these flats uh, so that the entire uh, expenditure is, in fact, as indicated, wasteful. Next one. Um, so there are uh, certain um, time and cost modifications that um, were approved. Uh, and you can see how the costs uh, started to escalate uh, it is clear that uh, there must have been some malfeasance involved in this. We uh, are investigating and we'll, we'll deal with that uh, in a subsequent slide. Next one, please. Uh, we have appointed uh, a legal firm to investigate um, this expenditure. Uh, we have instituted disciplinary action against the general manager uh, of facilities. Uh, he was found guilty uh, in January of last year. Uh, he was dismissed, and we are now conducting uh, disciplinary proceedings against an additional employee, uh, which is an, at an advanced stage. And we have initiated legal process to recover monies from the general manager who has been uh, terminated. Right, next slide, please. Uh, let's move on to the uh, recovery of debt due to ESCOM. I would like to request 
Mr. Monde Bala, who heads up our distribution division, to please deal with these slides. Monde, please. Thank you, uh, Andre. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members and Honorable Ministers. Uh, in terms of the recovery for ESCOM debt, uh, uh, as of January, uh, with an uh, end of January 2021, uh, the total payment levels uh, were sitting at 96.54, uh, which is broken down uh, into large power users, uh, which is mainly uh, key industrial customers, uh, sitting at 100% in terms of uh, payment levels. On the municipal uh, bulk accounts, we're sitting at 93.29. This is all the municipalities, including the metros. And of our uh, small power users, uh, we're sitting with a total of 95.73. And we've been asked to uh, give a, a breakdown with regards to Soweto. Uh, Soweto is currently sitting at 20%. I think it is important to note that uh, that has improved uh, from about 12% to about 20%. Uh, the rest of the other small power users uh, elsewhere were sitting at 98.11%. If you can move on to the next, next slide. Thank you, Natasha. We had been asked to give a breakdown in terms of the segments uh, on, on small power users, uh, mainly focusing on residential. The residential small power users, they constitute about 4.2% in terms of our customer base. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's the main issue on the slide. If we move to the next slide, Natasha. Uh, just on the uh, on the Soweto residential debt, uh, we are continuing with uh, some of the interventions uh, to uh, to improve the payment levels in Soweto. Uh, the issue of uh, a split metering, which we have started uh, to 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 uh, implement, uh, we are moving uh, uh, quite well uh, uh, along with that. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's 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 about it. Uh, the main focus here is just on the conversions. Uh, which we are rolling out on the municipal debt. Uh, please proceed, Natasha, on the municipal debt. Uh, yeah, this uh, just gives a, a a summary of uh, of our of our uh, progress on, on on municipal debt. The red line on top shows what you've projected uh, in terms of municipal debt and how it will rise had nothing been done. The green bars show the actual in terms of what we have managed to. Uh, to 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 achieve in as far as uh, the containment of the of the runaway debt uh, on, on municipalities. So uh, yeah, I think the, some of the interventions are uh, bearing fruits. However, yeah, there's a lot of challenges, and uh, with the political task team trying to assist us uh, uh, to deal with this uh, issue of the of municipal debt. Uh, thanks, Natasha. We have then been also asked to give the uh, the detail of the top 20 municipal debtors and uh, the, uh, the, the the detail has been given. Uh, I think with the uh, with Malutia Pufong being uh, at, at top of the uh, of the debtors and uh, the interventions with the active partnering that we have uh, that, that we're currently undertaking. Yeah, thanks, Natasha. Next slide, please. Sorry, uh, Mr. <coughs> Directors, we I'm forced to 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 stop you at the uh, in the next coming five minutes. In other words, at ten forty. Uh, <coughs> on the assumption Thank that we have uh, found time to go through, but then. Further interaction will come during the question, I mean, the deliberations. Otherwise, we may not finish. I've tried to increase and, and increase time, but it's like I won't finish incre increments. So <clears throat> uh, let's stop at 20 to 11. <clears throat> Thank you for that guidance, Honorable Chair. Monday, if you can uh, start wrapping up, please. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Thanks, uh, Andre. Yeah, on the government accounts, uh, 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 Chair and colleagues, uh, we just wanted to indicate that uh, we th there is no problems with the government accounts. Uh, what is owed to ES ESCOM is paid to ESCOM. There might be just be timing issues, but we, we are almost recovering fully from the government accounts. If we can move on, Natasha. 
uh, we've also been asked to give a a, a a a breakdown in terms of the private businesses that uh, that are owing ESCOM, and that is the breakdown. Uh, the next slide, which I think is the last slide uh, on this one. Uh, we've also been asked to give the top 20 private businesses that are owing ESCOM, and uh, and that 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 is uh, just the breakdown. I think that wraps up uh, the uh, the issue of the debt owed uh, owed to ESCOM, uh, Andre. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Chair and colleagues. Thank you, um, Mondo, Honorable Chair. Just uh, finally, uh, we can report that uh, we have been able to comply with all of the conditions related to the Special Appropriations Act for the financial year to date. So we are on track, on track to be fully compliant uh, by the end of this year, uh, financial year, which, which is imminent at the end of this month. Chair, with that, um, in the interest of time, if I may hand back to you uh, for your further guidance, please. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Directors and your team. Uh, honorable members, I think uh, this part partially covers the presentation that we have received so far with the assumption that members at some stage were able to interact with the entire uh, presentation which was made uh, sent to us earlier. It's not the fault of ESCOM that you did not really finish the entire presentation, but we did not anticipate that we will have so many slides. Uh, it's, it's not your fault, but then ourselves will see how do, how do we interact with the, the, the entire information and the report that we have sent to us. Uh, in the meantime, let me note hands for uh, engagement, uh, honorable members. Uh, uh, let me note hands uh, so that we can interact with the presentation. <clears throat> There's Mlenza and other chairperson. Okay. Uh, who else? I see the hand of uh, uh, Mr. Fisher. Matafa. Okay. Honorable Matafa. Honorable. Um, no okay. No, no. Uh, I said honorable the poor Peters. Who who is this? And Langweni, sir. Yes, okay. Honorable Langweni. Okay. Right. Uh let, let, let's take some five minutes each and see where do you go. Uh, let me start with uh, Honorable uh, Nanzana. Chairperson. Honorable Dipu. Just before you continue, um, the, the Honorable Chairperson usually gives us, after such an expensive uh, presentation, gives us two minutes break for comfort break or a nature's call break so that we don't even miss on what other colleagues would raise so that we don't repeat questions. I'm just appealing. It's an appeal and reminding you that uh, you could learn from the chairperson's uh, approach to these long presentations. Thank you, Chair. I was checking your time, uh, Honorable Tipu. Uh, I thought that we will be able to manage that in between the space. Uh, okay, thank you. But I take note of that, uh, but I, I'm just uh, worried about time. Uh, let's proceed, Honorable Mlenzan. Uh, thanks, Chairperson. Uh, uh, let me ask that uh, the video remains off. Uh, uh, this. Uh, weather is very terrible, so connectivity is very bad. Uh, Chairperson, uh, let, let me welcome Chairperson the presentation by ESCOM and uh, echo what you are raising that uh, ESCOM has actually made this uh, mammoth uh, task and as per our request. 
so now we we are at this stage not very able to bite and uh, chew thoroughly all that we asked for. The dish is very rich in front of us. And as such, let me premise uh, by saying to ESCOM, I, I know that uh, there is nothing wrong with me writing uh, an open letter uh, after I would have studied all this detail. Uh, I will write a detailed letter to ESCOM, which I will file through uh, the office of uh, the, the, the secretary of the committee, uh, expecting that you will take time as per your agreement with the, the committee secretary to, to resort back to me. Hence, uh, I have lifted a few issues because of time, as you are saying. I may not even take that five minutes. It will be less. A generic question, Chair, if, if a ESCOM can take us to confidence, are we about to see an end to, 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 to load shedding? We are public representatives. These questions are asked to us time in, time out. If yes, is there a program to realize such uh, where we would be saying, no more load shedding. Uh, this, of course, would link with another question, which is now at a lighter note, deliberately. I've listened carefully when uh, a, a response to call contracts was given. My question also is very short, deliberately. Of the seven suppliers, uh, do we have a, a table which tells us which is the longest service uh, serving a, a contract or are they all the longest serving uh, contractors? Uh, what is the, the review period of such contracts? Uh, because I can see Chair, that we are sitting here with a situation where Uzo Shala within and you are unable to solve the problem and the problem is still here to stay if we can be given uh, some kind of an exit way where ultimately we will also see ourselves out of I, I see we are more negotiating from a back foot if I can see a, as ESCOM than the, the coal suppliers the coal suppliers are at the upper hand, if you listen to the tone uh, of the manner in which the negotiations are actually, you know, ensuing. Chair, on expansions, I have just picked on two here because uh, I had the benefit of uh, being part of uh, the select committee then uh, in the fourth term of parliament when we were all crazy about Kusila and Midupi uh, being, you know, up and running within no time. And here today, we are still talking about that. Can we get the amount of approved expansions from the date of inception of each of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, projects, Kusila and Midupi, uh, to date? How much? Uh, when we are talking expansions, uh, without reasons. Uh, the second one is, uh, is there, do we have unapproved continued expansions? If yes, to what cost? Also, do we have any unapproved and stopped uh, expansions? If yes, what are the current implications where we are saying we cannot uh, do one, two, three because of this particular unapproved uh, 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 application? On, on deviations, Chairperson, 
it will take almost the same the same trend. One would like to know the amount of deviations uh, that were not approved but continued. Uh, do you have the cost factor of that? The amount of deviations that were unapproved and stopped. Uh, there I'm interested also in uh, the project implications. Uh, what is it that, that suffered because of such? And then the last one on deviations would be uh, generally the amount or the total amount of deviations per financial year that ESCOM would always come up with. And the reasons behind, because the, the, why I'm interested in this last part, particularly getting the reasons behind such deviations, the total figure, is isn't that bordering on uh, the manner in which ESCOM plans uh, is it not bordering on that people just wake up and go to work and do whatever, not exactly knowing what to do and how? Then the last chair would be on consequence management. Even this one chair, uh, I, I'm not detailed deliberately. I've just picked on one single question because remember when we were at Mega Park, uh, in our last oversight visit, I asked the same question. Hence now, I just want to know how many cases have been dealt with to closure, not just dealt with. Remember when we had Mega Park, there were pending cases, a series of them. Uh, even today, we're told of a series of other cases. But now I'm interested in the number of cases which were dealt with to closure, to a close, just for a period between our last oversight visit in the Mega Park uh, and to date. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Mlenzana. Uh, I saw a hand here. I mistakenly, I mistakenly that hand with one of the <clears throat> committee members, but then uh, uh, we don't allow public members here. They have their platform of uh, public hearing or they can write to the secretary. Let me call uh, uh, Honorable Matafa. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, let me join Honorable Mlenzana in welcoming the presentation and also commending the detailed uh, content of the presentation. Uh, clearly there's transparency and there's adherence to the request for clarity by the committee, which also supports the last input by the CEO, Mr. Director, to say that they are on track to fully complying with the conditions attached to the Special Appropriations Bill. At the tone chair, let me also pass my greetings to the minister, the board chair, and uh, the CEO and the team from ESCOM in totality. Chair, I, I have quite a few issues that I wanted to chew on, but maybe to underscore what Honorable Mlenzana has put in onto the table, I will try to speak in line with the issues that he was raising because I see he was flying very high. I want to dig, dig down into the surface a little bit. Honorable Mlenzana speaks about the issue of load shedding. Now, Chair, there is one slide in the presentation that speaks about the risks of uh, not being able to have consistent supply from, I think it's South 32, if I'm not mistaken. Now, I, I'm, I'm interested to find out what happens in the event that this particular entity does go eventually into business rescue. What measures do we have in place to mitigate the ultimate eventuality should it go into business rescue? 
And it also speaks to the issue of load shedding. And, and it will be interesting to know if indeed it goes to business rescue and no call submission is sustained at that particular mine, is there a likelihood that we are going to be besieged with a situation that the national power grid might be constrained and uh, load shedding might rear its, its head again? The, 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 the second one, it's just a generic one, uh, and it speaks on the last slide that we did not delve in, on the unbundling process and the, the, the progress made there too. This one, I'm just interested to know, what is the view of the board or the CEO in terms of the progress made thus far? Is it moving in terms of the expectation or is there some strengthening that is, 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 is required? I'll, I'll really appreciate to be responded on that one, Chair. The second one, let me welcome the intervention as far as strengthening the supply chain processes uh, at, at ESCOM, particularly the appointment of the divisional procurement lead. Now, um, I'm, I'm interested to know as far as ABB uh, recovery of some funds that were overpaid, has there been an investigation if whether there was any collusion between ESCOM employees and the company? And Chair, I'm raising on this one simply because there is a deviation in favor of ABB, even though ABB has been found wanting on one end. And in one of the slides, there's a assertion that there was collusion in a particular contract and one senior person has been relieved of their duties at ESCO. So I'm interested to find out how was this one treated? We are still in contractual obligation in some other areas with ABB, but on the other hand, they were found wanting. Was there collusion? If yes, what happened? And if anything uh, is still in the process, how far is that particular process? Chair, I also still on the issue of suspensions and, and, and relieving of people's duties. Again, in the presentation, ESCOM does say that there are certain issues that are in the public domain and, and, and they are stirring public opinion. I, I want to throw a spanner in the works, not delving into the issues of labor. There is highly uh, there's a reporting of uh, the suspension of the chief procurement officer. I, I'm interested to find out how does this impact on the interventions that ESCOM is making to strengthen supply chain in the absence of such a key, 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 key position. Uh, we know that there will be a discussion uh, at SCOPA to find out how then they can be able to, to resolve this issue. But the second part of the question is that how does this suspension impact on the conditional approvals on the deviations and expansions as given by National Treasury? If you go through the reasons for the conditional approvals, Chair, you will see most of them have time frames and conditions such as on the final conclusion of the tender process or subject to compliance with the strict procurement processes. Now, definitely there, you need someone of authority to ensure that those particular issues are, are attended to. Now, Chair, on this one, I, I think I have a different understanding on uh, from Comrade uh, Mlenzan on the cold contracts negotiations. My understanding is that ESCOM has took a bottom-up approach and identified seven coal suppliers who are medium, short-term to medium-term contracted to ESCOM. Now, from various media reports, there is a narrative that this particular contract are as a result of the long-term long contract suppliers being unable to meet the supply demand for ESCOM, hence as ESCOM entered into this particular contract. Now, the question that follows from that is that what informed the bottom-up approach? Would it not have been prudent to engage the long-term contracts 
if the issue is priced, how do these short to medium term prices compare to the long term uh, 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 prices, uh, long term contract prices? Because from for me, it, it it follows that when a contract is of a longer term, the price is normally favorable, and when it's shorter term, the price might be higher. But if you look into the nitty gritties, it does not necessarily mean it is expensive at a short a short term. Coupled to that, chair, further reporting again in the media and other inquiries is that most of these emergency call suppliers are companies or mines owned by people of African descent. I'll be interested to know the demographics of this particular contract and, and also how does it impact on the transformation agenda as, as, as always pronounced by, by, by the president. And I think Chair, on the letter that Honorable Menzana is, is, is suggesting, I would also deposit one point where ESCOM takes us into its confidence to say what is their transformation program? What are the targets? How far are they? And are they satisfied with their target? Again, Chair, public opinion is that contracts owned by Africans are under attack at ESCOM. I think this platform gives ESCOM the opportunity to clarify the A once and for all, to be able to identify where there are these particular narratives uh, coming from and they are cleared once and, and, and for all. So <clears throat> in terms of um, the issue of uh, transforming ESCOM, there was a roadmap that was presented to the committee, uh, established or crafted in 2019. I'm just interested on the progress as far as that is concerned, just at high level, to say that generally the roadmap, we are 40, 20, 30 or 60% to, to achieving it, because I think that has a bearing on the debt uh, level of ESCOM, it has a bearing on load shedding as well. And also it is, has a bearing on turning around the revenue collection issues. The, 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 the second last one is on the issue again of uh, transformation at ESCOM. I just need clarity on the contract of Econ Oil. On one slide, slide 59, there is a dispute on overcharging by Econ Oil. But again, there is a submission that there is a process of trying to set aside bid COP 4786. Now, my question is, are these two related, the overcharging and the setting aside of bid COP 4786? And if whether, will the setting aside of the 4786 have a bearing on the first one or does it resolve it? I'll really be interested to know if whether it will resolve it or they are, they are, they are, separate, they are separate issues. And Chair, the last one is on, uh, you know, I touched that one. Oh yeah, the last one is the deviation, uh, again, in terms of South 32, where the contract value was 11.4 billion and the value of the deviation is estimated at 66.98 billion rands. There's a high premium there as far as the deviation is concerned. Now, now the question would be, what value is ESCOM deriving in having to pay this particular premium? Simply put, does the expansion or the deviation at that amount justifies the, 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 the ultimate uh, outcome? Or does the outcome justify the, the premium that you're going to pay, uh, rather put in, 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 that, in that way? Chair, I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. But once again, thanks for the team uh, for the sterling work that they've done in responding to, to our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Matafa. Honorable uh, Peters. Thank you, Chair. Can I also be allowed to switch off my video? We've got a bit of a challenge to start. OK, you may proceed. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to join colleagues in uh, thanking uh, the presenters from ESCOM 
led by the minister and uh, the deputy minister I've seen on the platform, as well as the leadership of ESCO. Uh, Chairperson, I don't know whether I should join. No, I do. I, I join Honorable Mulenzano with regard to the issues of the uh, deviations and in, in other matters. Let me start with the deviations. What was the process of contracting with Howden Power, which made it difficult for ESCOM to detect that this supplier does not have the requisite license for the manufacture, supply, and delivering of the air, the air heater space? In essence, Howden was a middleman or sales agent for the supply of these goods. How does Howden Power it ident how was Howden Power identified? and further shortlisted when they did not have the license. Also, has ESCOM investigated the National Treasury's recommendation to investigate elements of fruitless and wasteful expenditure? Has ESCOM conducted these assessments? If yes, what is the outcome? Have any ESCOM employee been charged with misconduct? What disciplinary steps have been taken by ESCOM where employees have been found to be guilty of this misconduct? But Jefferson also, who is responsible for procurement and contract management at Kusine and Mitupi power stations? Because consistently applications for expansion are sought after the contract has expired, which in itself is a misconduct. From your list of local suppliers of goods and services, how many are for South African women, youth, and people with disabilities. Because it is important, like Honorable Matafa has raised, that we understand how we have performed with regard to ESCOM's trans uh, transformation agenda. When will we see the conclusion of Kusile and Midupi power plants? I have seen on the presentation an indication that unit six of uh, Midupi will be coming in around, uh, is it July 2021? and Kusile around 2022. But we know that we've been given these dates over and over again. And it doesn't seem that ESCOM, when they give us the date, they have really used proper project management techniques to be able to determine how they can reach that particular date. In a situation where ESCOM gets uh, not approved, for deviation, extensions, and modifications. What then happens in that particular situation? Do you abandon the project or what then happens in that particular situation? It's very important for us to know. But Chairperson, what will be the impact of municipalities, especially and in the, the intensive energy users option to procure power from IPPs be for the revenue of ESCOM? We need to know whether there's going to be a massive a, a dip in the revenue of ESCOM because they would not be getting that particular a, a money. I heard the, the one of the presenters, I don't know whether it was the CEO, indicating that there was a state capture period in, 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 in ESCOM. Does it mean that according to him, the residues and the elements of state capture that he has seen through the malfeasance and the uh, procurement related misconducts that happened at ESCOM are, are over. And what informs him that it's over? I'm happy to hear about the Velcher residential project that somebody was held responsible and that the cost will be uh, 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 recouped from 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 the relevant uh, 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 manager who actually is responsible for this project. But truly speaking, how did we arrive at the point where ESCOM can build those particular units and later on realize that they don't need those uh, beautiful uh, flats that they have shown us on the screen? And it is important that we also know about the overpayments. How much have been recovered so far? And what is it that you are doing to make it possible that the total amount is recovered from those overpayments? And who has been held responsible for these overpayments? Because it is important for us to know how uh, 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 ESCOM has been able to deal with the relevant officials who were responsible for these uh, overpayments. With regard to, to the debt, I also want to know what happened to the energy efficiency program of ESCOM? Because it doesn't look like ESCOM anymore speaks about 
that a 49M initiative that was launched by the then Deputy President uh, Kalima Mutlante at the time, because there was an a, a ESCOM's energy efficiency program, there was an initiative where ESCOM was actually putting up solar water visas to the households that were having the bulk impact on, especially even in, 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 in the hospitality industry, and also converting some of the stoves to, 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 to gas stoves. One would want to know what has happened in, in regard to that. But also, Chairperson, with Medipi and Kusile, and also globally, ESCOM being seen as South Africa's biggest emitter. What is ESCOM doing with regard to the clean coal technology? as well as the carbon capture and storage roadmap that was launched where uh, uh, ESCOM was equally an important stakeholder. Because as South Africa, it is important that we protect our uh, uh, coal reserves and know that South Africa is not even in the next 10 or 20 years going to abandon the use of coal. So it is important that uh, 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 clean coal technologies be part of the vocabulary and programs of ESCOM so that we can then be able to protect the, the, the jobs in the mining sector. But also uh, the, the, the small miners, as well as previously disadvantaged individual uh, miners, how many of them benefit from the coal contracts of, of, uh, of ESCOM? That also speaks to the transformation uh, 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 agenda of ESCOM. Lastly, Chairperson, what is the localization percentage for ESCOM, because it is important that we know, DTI has set a target of about 65% localization for some of the, the, the industries uh, in, 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 in South Africa. Is ESCOM also insisting on localization so that we know that whatever is new that ESCOM is involved in is also benefiting the industries in South Africa, especially now with the impact of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Peters. Honorable Nsanguini. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, and thank you very much for ESCOM for the 92 page uh, presentation. Um, I think I want to also agree, as uh, we have talked on the chat room with that Honorable uh, Peters have put a proposal that ESCOM need to come for a whole day because the way we are going about it, Chair, it seems we are just touching here and there to the core problems of what is really happening in ESCOM. Um, so we really need a full day, but I also don't want us to overlap to the work that SCOPA is currently doing uh, with ESCOM. So we really need to find a way how we gonna 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 do it. Um, Honorable Chair, then I want to also agree with Honorable Matafa on the transformation agenda of ESCOM. Um, maybe perhaps uh, the CEO can uh, or the minister can enlighten us with the the trans formation agenda of ESCOM, the work that they have done and the work that they are planning to, to do going forward to transform ESCOM in terms of all the components, whether from skills, whether from contracts and so forth. Because we always hear, uh, sometimes when ESCOM come, you always hear about that is a, a Legend pro, uh, legendary project or, or, or skills that can't be accessed here in the country. And we always need to get these people in from uh, Russia or wherever. And I use just Russia as an example. It can be other countries because they have been uh, um, sourcing skills from other country within ESCOM, especially I think at the time of the Kusile and the so forth uh, uh, power station. Uh, Chair, I want to also go into which one, which is very concerning um, for me. I, I don't know, I, I just get a feeling that, I, I still can't grasp it that the, the, the board, and I, I, I'm, I'm making this statement, I, I, 
I don't know how to put it, Chair, but I'm going to just put it in, in the English that I'm, 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 I'm thinking it. Uh, the, 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 the board don't want ESCOM to succeed. Because if you want a business to succeed, you wouldn't have had so many deviations that is to procurement relating issues. Because it seems to me the business model, they don't know how to track the procurement, they don't know how to track the pay overpayments and so forth. And that is why I'm making that statement that maybe perhaps there are some people in ESCOM that don't want ESCOM to succeed. And they want to sell off this entity to the highest bidder. And that is very concerning, Chair, because you can, if you look at the Howden Power uh, contract, how do you just go in and, and, and not you, so much money you give to a contract that don't have the required license to manufacture this uh, 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 air heater uh, uh, parts? What was your prerequisite checks on ensuring that these companies are qualified to do the work within ESCOM than just to uh, um, sort of giving a person a contract and, 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 and it's, it's, it, later on when you want to renew, you find out, oh, oh this person don't have the re, uh, a required license. So how do you shortlist then such a company? How did you do your checks? Then, Chair, in the contract failure again and the poor contract performance, why is the soft market, they are not, uh, the soft market testing and early market engagement not an express requirement for ESCOM's procurement policy? Because National Treasury, and in most of the cases here, National Treasury are referring them to conduct uh, market testing. So it means within the procurement, it's not done. So I would like to know why, if National Treasury have been telling you through the years, and I, it is my second term in, in appropriations, and it does have been always been one of your reasons. So why haven't you have put it in your procurement policy then? if you know that this is what a national treasury is going to ask you. And then, Chair, on the, the one of the, um, the South 32, I'd like to know how is ESCOM mitigating the risk of load shedding? Should there be no coal supply from the Dover power station for an extended period? How are they going to mitigate that for in terms of load shedding? And then in terms of, I think it's slide 13, or I don't know which number on all of those numbers is it, but I, in, on my side, it's on slide 13. As to like, what I would like to ask is, when is the contract of Actom uh, coming to an end? And I think the Honorable Dupour already asked the issue of the procurement um, contract management in Kusila and Matupi. It's been really a very long time, Chair. And we can't hear all the time it's state capture. We can't be hearing all the time now it's state capture. The other, other departments is telling us it's COVID. Now ESCOM is coming, it's state capture. So some of these things needed to be sorted out by now. And uh, extensive work needs to be done um, really in, in this regard. So some of this uh, work needs to be, uh, um, and some of these deviations and, and irregular expenditures and so forth and disciplinary of the employees should have been done by now. So that is all my part, uh, my few questions from my part, um, Chair. Uh, I will join on the on the members that we we need to really have 
really a day's work with ESCOM because to do a 92 page presentation and we just get five minutes to ask questions is not really doing the process justice because now we really had to run through our questions uh, and, and maybe we may have missed crucial things in the 92 page. Because if they send the 92 page, by, by now we should have had this presentation two weeks before, advan- um, before time of this committee, because we are sitting in various committees and we don't, don't just wait around for ESCOM's presentation. So really we need to uh, look into how we're gonna do work to make ESCOM work because seemingly they don't want it to work, but we will make it work. Thank you very much, Shay. Thank you very much, <coughs> Honorable Ntlangwini. We, uh, in, indeed, uh, Honorable Members, uh, like I've said uh, during the opening that maybe it is as a result of a series of questions that we sent to ESCOM to respond directly to specific issues that as a committee we raised with them uh, in the letter that we wrote to them. So we did not know that it will result into a 90 page. So I, I fully agree with members that we actually need the uh, almost two days to finish up what has been a response from a written uh, a report to this committee about specific issues that we said they must respond. Uh, a number of issues uh, honorable members have covered me if I'm just before I give to, <clears throat> uh, to ESCOM. Uh, uh, let me note first before I come in the, the hand of, you want to come now, uh, honorable minister? Uh, minister Pravin, you want to come now? Thank you, thank you Chair. Uh, perhaps you can ask your questions, but I was going to uh, firstly answer some of the issues and secondly request that I be excused because I've got some other urgent meetings from 11.30 onwards. But perhaps let, let's hear your questions because I might contribute to that. Okay, no, I think it's fine. <clears throat> so ESCOM has a, a very long history uh, on issues, some of the issues that we have talked about here. Uh, but we can't just find them uh, uh, right at the end of the day. Uh, it has been very long process that have been talked about here. Uh, so at one stage when we're doing oversight, I remember one said, hey, ESCOM, it's actually facing an oncoming traffic. <clears throat> so let me go to my questions. Uh, I just want to understand from the ESCOM whether do you have tariff increase uh, in in uh, in line, or are you thinking about implementation or applying for any tariff increase? Uh, that obviously one would think it would be unfair if you take into cognizance. Uh, how the economy is performing, f- especially for the poor. <clears throat> now, let me come to the Velcher project. Yes, my colleague have talked about that pro- that issue, especially about you know non uh, utilization of that infrastructure by ESCOM. But I want to hear then what what is your way forward with regard to that because it was just a wasteful uh, exercise that. ESCOM you did, but it's not sufficient to say you have realized that uh, it was a, a something that seemed to be wasteful. But then what is your way forward with regard to that uh, village, uh, Velcha project? Uh, when we are doing oversight, we talked about the ESCOM finance uh, uh, branch, the disposal of ESCOM finance branch. But it doesn't seem that ESCOM has now uh, finally decided to implement, uh, to effect that your own decision that you are, you are going to now uh, uh, disband that or do away with that. So I want to know what are the reasons since we have met as a, with met with you during the oversight that we have not implemented that decision. Now on the, 
also want I also want to know why ESCOM are you continuing to follow wrong procurement procedures as we have mentioned uh, rightfully so during your 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 your, your, your uh, and the treasury has been uh, has sent back a number of you, some of your requests that they realize that you you, you want to do wrong things uh, you know in most instances especially around the issue of procurement. Uh, why are you insisting to do wrong things? <clears throat> now, the performance of the contractors or some of these contractors have been, uh, you know, underperforming or performing the way you are not expecting them to perform. But we have not, you have been failing to impose some penalties, uh, for instance, which is a loss uh, uh, in that. And one would not surprise when you come back and say you are operating at a loss now. So, and that operation at a loss actually put a burden on the uh, on yourself and actually at the economy because ESCOM actually is a when you talk about economic recovery, ESCOM plays a very crucial part in as far as you know boosting the economy. But now, given these challenges that we are we have presented uh, before us. Uh, we are creating a condition that is going to be very difficult uh, to, you know, let the economy find its footing uh, moving forward. If we are not going to remedy this situation, the way we have agreed uh, that you actually found your footing, especially with regard to your turnaround strategy, uh, 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 and also follow up on the on the the roadmap. Uh, 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 that was outlined, you know, we want to know how far did ESCOM uh, do with regard to the roadmap that the Department of Enterprises actually, you know, uh, unfolded. Uh, so we think you still owe us a, a feedback to say, how far did you follow up? Because I, I think the roadmap was actually trying to assist the process so, so that now, ESCOM must also find its footing. <clears throat> so what are you doing in the short term? Uh, uh, yeah. So I think uh, for now, let me pause with those uh, few questions uh, and, and let uh, uh, ESCOM uh, reply on those questions. We are aware that at the end of the day, maybe we might not finish, but let me give also the minister before he leaves us to say something. Minister Gordon. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the honorable members for the questions. I, I will address uh, some of the questions raised. Uh, there are a few members of the board of ESCOM because some questions have been asked about the board. They can respond to those. And then some of the details uh, the CEO and his colleagues can, can uh, address. So on, on the matter of uh, the roadmap, which several colleagues have raised, uh, as uh, Honorable Matafa pointed out, it was published in November or so 2019. There is uh, an office within uh, ESCOM, which is uh, responsible for the implementation of uh, the roadmap. And we receive regular reports in that regard. Uh, and we're quite satisfied with uh, the first objective being the separation of transmission uh, as part of the separation of the three un uh, units, generation, transmission, and distribution. And we will be engaging uh, in, in the detail further uh, with our ESCOM colleagues to see if some of that can be speeded up. But these are complex processes, Chair, where you have to separate financials, uh, uh, financial statements, auditing processes, IT systems, human resources, and so on. So once you get into the complexity of the separation, uh, you'll find that ESCOM has made some good progress, but I uh, can give you the assurance that if some of that can be shortened, uh, we can uh, certainly expect ESCOM to do that. On the question of the transformation agenda, uh, I think ESCOM should be given a bit more time to give you some details, but uh, we track as a department various aspects of transformation. 
but we don't have, unfortunately, that detail available now. And as you correctly pointed out, Chair, the length of the presentation is dependent on the, on the questions that the committee asked. Uh, so you can't blame Eskom for 90 odd slides. That's the questions you raised and you want accountability. Well, that's the accountability in terms of the transparency of the information that's actually available. The next point that uh, a few colleagues have raised is the question of state capture. State capture is a reality teacher. It's unfolding before the Zondo Commission right now. And uh, there's many more uh, pieces of information including from the inquiry undertaken by the Parliamentary Committee on Public Enterprises during 2017 and a report that was accepted in the National Assembly. So the damage caused by state capture, whether it's Madupi, Kusile, the procurement systems, uh, the extraction of money in one form or another, the coal supplies that were disrupted, which today different people want to try to find different explanations for, but that was the reality that the Gupta family and their related uh, entities uh, did want to benefit from ESKIM, did benefit from ESKIM, and uh, some of the recovery processes is what the executives and the board is dealing with. So we can't uh, say state capture is over. I think corruption is still a feature uh, within ESKIM itself, and it will take time to uncover it. Uh, and as the CEO will tell you, there are some 3,000 people involved in the procurement system uh, within ESCOM. So that's a lot of people to monitor. And in recent times, uh, some people have been showing off on Facebook and something and other forms of media about the assets that they have, which are out of tune with their income. So if we undertake uh, the lifestyle audits across the board, I think we'll have some uh, interesting revelations, and that has been done at a particular level. Wilke, uh, as a project, is a very good example of mistakes made a long time ago, which the current management and board is trying to rectify. Uh, so yes, the questions are valid, but I think we need to place all of this in context, because the context does particularly matter in this particular case as, as well. Whilst uh, Honorable Ntlangweni might say, we can't hear state capture all the time, I'm, I'm afraid. As long as it's a reality and its impact hasn't been removed, it's not too different from what uh, today the scientists describe as long COVID chair. Some people have COVID and they recover very quickly. Others feel the effects for a very, very long time. And nobody knows the kind of impact that COVID has over uh, a two or three year period. So this is uh, the long COVID of state capture and uh, habits need to change, culture needs to change, performance management must take place. And uh, I think all of us would agree that ESCOM needs to become a high performance organization. And in order to do that, we're gonna trample on toes and people are going to use race, gender, and all sorts of excuses uh, to justify their lack of performance. On the question of emissions, as Honorable Peters has raised, uh, the president has set up a climate change commission. Uh, several ministers and outside uh, individuals are part of it. And as a government, we remain committed to uh, achieving uh, low emissions, but also achieving the kind of commitments that we've made uh, as part of the climate change talks, which take place again uh, later this year in, in the United Kingdom. And the CEO will explain some of the dilemmas that ESCOM is dealing with uh, in relation to some of the worst performing plants uh, like Kendall Power Station, for, for example. Uh, I want to disagree with Honorable Nklangweni that some people or the board doesn't want ESCOM to succeed. That's not true. I think the board is very committed to wanting uh, ESCOM to succeed. That there might be others who don't want ESCOM to succeed. I certainly agree with her. And uh, we, we've all got to ensure that we protect this utility uh, as best we can in order that it can perform uh, the right level of performance. On the tariff question that you've raised, the CEO will, will, will address the process right now. Uh, there are tentative uh, tariff levels that have been set, but they are still, as you correctly point out, Chair, uh, discussions that must be had about what's affordable, what's not affordable. 
but also from an ESCOM point of view, uh, how do we meet the debt burden of 480 billion rands and what contributions can be made uh, by tariff increases, but what can be done through other processes as well. On the disposable, uh, disposal of the ESCOM finance uh, company, uh, the pandemic has affected not only human beings, it's also affected uh, the price of assets. And uh, that process is one that we are still committed to as the department and as ESCOM. Uh, but I think that you don't want to just dispose of an asset because we've said so without getting the right price for it. Uh, but there are complex processes that are at play uh, within, within ESCOM itself. So Chair, thank you very much for your patience. And uh, the CEO and his team will handle or respond to the rest of the questions. And with your consent, I wish to excuse myself, please. No, thank you very much, uh, Minister, with your contribution to this portfolio committee meeting, and thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. you are released. Uh, can I take now this opportunity to give uh, Master the Raiders and your team uh, to respond on, uh, on the questions from the members? Thank you, Honourable Chair, and thank you to uh, all the members for uh, the diligence with which they have uh, perused the presentation and the questions that they've asked. Uh, I shall try and address as many of the questions as I can. Um, in response to the Honourable Menzana's question on an end to load shedding, uh, as we communicated in January of last year, we have a maintenance backlog that we need to uh, catch up on. Uh, we have launched a reliability maintenance recovery program. And during this program, as we communicated a year ago, there is an elevated risk of load shedding as we take major units offline in order to carry out the required maintenance. Uh, these units will return to service by the end of April of this year, so imminently. And by then, we will see a step change reduction in the risk of load shedding. We will then take out another round of units on further maintenance. And by September of uh, this year, we should see a marked reduction, but not an elimination entirely of the risk of load shedding. Uh, we must point out that, uh, as we've said in our presentation, we welcome the procurement process followed by the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy to add additional capacity to the grid. Uh, there was a recent determination to procure an additional 11.8 gigawatts. We believe that this is uh, necessary and we welcome these steps uh, to bridge the shortfall uh, that uh, currently exists, but also that will continue to arise as our aging power stations reach the end of their operational life. With regard to the question around uh, the coal contracts and uh, which coal contract is the longest serving, uh, all of the contracts, uh, with the exception of one, is of a duration of less than two years. So they are true short-term contracts. There is a 12-year contract that uh, remains, and that is with a company called Mzumkulu. Um, on the process um, for expansions for Madupi and Kusile, there was a uh, process followed um, where various uh, approvals were obtained uh, from the board as indicated in our presentation. And we are still in alignment with the uh, approval that we obtained from the board in 2015. So we, we are still on track as far as that is con concerned. Um, when a deviation or expansion is not approved, we do not continue. Uh, that would be uh, contrary to the oversight role played by National Treasury. So uh, that is something that we do not entertain and we do not do. In terms of the anticipated deviations, it's very difficult to give you uh, an example. Uh, these requests that we put to National Treasury for approval, 75% uh, of which 
typically are approved. So uh, when we when we make these requests, uh, we are not met with an unreasonable response from National Treasury. They approve three quarters uh, of these requests. Uh, but where we believe that there's a business case to be made, for example, when a contractor has already uh, established uh, itself on site and there is a likely efficiency gain or a price advantage that we can get as ESKIM in order to reduce the overall cost, then typically that is an example of when we would approach National Treasury to ask their permission in accordance with the procedure. And if National Treasury then agrees, then obviously we proceed. If they don't, as we have done uh, with the uh, Camden Ashdam project, then we, we have to ask the contractor to, to vacate the site and then we go out to open tender. So it's not a question of wanting to avoid approaching the open market for bids. Uh, we are driven by the best interests of the business. In terms of uh, consequence management, uh, Chair, a number of uh, members raised um, uh, questions in this regard. Um, we have uh, identified 3,686 uh, employees for disciplinary inquiry, uh, 1,126 disciplinary uh, inquiries were completed. It was found that in 1,241 cases, uh, disciplinary inquiries were not inquiries were not required. Um, six employees um, have in fact been declared, and there are 1,319 disciplinary inquiries uh, outstanding based on uh, referrals received from the the SIU. Now, if you uh, reconcile the SIU reported cases with the number of ESCOM disciplinary cases, this is not due to a misalignment between ourselves and the SIU. Uh, it is because the SIU reports cases based on individual incidents, whereas we uh, report cases based on the individual uh, employees. So uh, one employee may be the subject of a number of disciplinary inquiries. So that is why if you, if you try and reconcile those numbers, they, they may not necessarily uh, add up. As of um, 31st of December of uh, last year, uh, our industrial relations department had registered 154 disciplinary cases emanating from forensic investigations. Uh, of these cases, 143 have been completed, 11 are in progress. The completed disciplinary cases have resulted in 64 employees resigning during disciplinary processes with a further 26 being dismissed as a result of fraud and corruption. So I think, uh, Honorable Chair, hopefully members will gain comfort from this information that we are in fact uh, applying appropriate consequence management. Um, in response to the question from uh, Honorable Mataha, the, uh, with regard to South 32, um, the Duvo power station was designed as a mine mouth power station. So it was designed to be fed by conveyor belt leading directly from the mine. Consequently, what we have seen is that there is an inadequate coal handling facility to accommodate the uh, handling of coal uh, trucked in by road to uh, the Duva power station. So we are unable to receive the full coal requirement uh, needed to keep all the units at Duva running. Uh, there are five units uh, by importing coal by road. So we are dependent on the importation of uh, coal uh, by means of conveyor belt in order to keep um, this power station functioning. If we were to allow the South 32 uh, business rescue process to unfold, what would happen is that we would uh, lose the coal feed to three units at Duva power station, and that would be equivalent 
to the loss of some 2,000 megawatts of generation capacity. So hopefully what is clear from that is that uh, it is in the interest of maintaining uh, electricity on the grid to uh, do our best to avoid South 32 going into business rescue at the Duva mine. Uh, as Mr. Nagar has indicated, there is a process ongoing to uh, buy South 32 to sell its coal interests in South Africa to Siriki Resources. Uh, and that uh, we trust if that transaction is approved, it has already been approved by the competition tribunal, but it now needs national treasury approval. If that is approved, then uh, this risk will uh, in all probability be averted and uh, the associated uh, jobs that are at risk in a business rescue process will also be preserved. As the Honorable Minister has indicated, our progress on unbundling uh, is satisfactory. Uh, we are making very good progress uh, with the legal separation in particular of our transmission business unit. This is the primary objective set for us in the uh, DPE roadmap. However, uh, we must point out that this process is not entirely in the control of ESKIM. We are dependent on other uh, government entities and regulatory authorities for various approvals in order to make progress. And while we engage regularly with these government departments and regulatory bodies, we cannot uh, give a cast iron guarantee that we will receive all the requisite approvals in time for us to meet the target in uh, the roadmap. But we are working very hard to ensure that this happens. Um, the question raised around um, ABB uh, is, a, is, a, is a challenging one for ESKIM. Uh, ABB has been a long-standing supplier to ESKIM, and it is a manufacturer and supplier of a number of uh, transformers, uh, switchgear equipment, uh, substation-related equipment, uh, that we require to keep our business running. Now, they, they have been, essentially from Eskom's inception, they have been a supplier to this company. They are therefore deeply integrated into our ecosystem. And if I may, Honorable Chair, by way of metaphor uh, or by way of a comparison, just explain that if you buy an Apple computer, you are essentially... Uh, bound to using Apple as your ecosystem uh, until you decide to take your computer, throw it away, uh, and you then move to um, a Windows-compatible computer. But you cannot uh, migrate from one to the other without incurring very substantial cost. Uh, we are aware that uh, ABB have self-declared uh, certain unlawful and collusive practices at the um, Kusile power station uh, and based on negotiations conducted between ourselves, ABB and the SIU, we were able to recover an amount of 1.577 billion rand, which was paid to ESKIM on the 23rd of December of last year. In order to ensure that we are compliant in our future dealings with ABB, we have written a letter to the Director General of the National Treasury, and we have requested uh, his guidance on how we deal with ABB going forward, having regard to the fact that if we uh, were to eliminate ABB entirely, A, from the completion of the work that they are currently doing at Kusile, and uh, that work is more than 90% complete, we will incur significant delay in bringing online uh, further units at Kusile. We will have to um, replace all of the equipment that has been installed. We will incur significant claims from other contractors for standing time and we will significantly increase the risk of load shedding going forward. So these are dilemmas that we are grappling with. 
and we are relying on the advice and guidance of National Treasury to assist us in uh, making the appropriate decision having regard to good governance. Um, the uh, suspension of the CPO uh, will not create a gap in uh, the procurement department. Of course, there is a team that uh, reports into the CPO and uh, we have capable and competent people who are willing and able to uh, deal with all of the uh, approvals uh, that we request from National Treasury. So I do not anticipate uh, a negative impact in that regard. Um, the uh, question regarding the long-term supply of coal is a, is a, is a very uh, pertinent question. Uh, in 2013, Eskom took a decision to uh, cease further capital injections into so-called cost plus mines. And this was intended to liberate capital that could then be diverted into Madupi and Kusili, essentially. Uh, this decision, however, as a consequence, uh, had an impact on the ability of these long-term uh, suppliers of ESKIM to supply at the required levels. And uh, the, the honorable member is absolutely correct that uh, coal delivered by conveyor uh, in close proximity to the power station typically is cheaper and of a more consistent quality than coal delivered by road. Uh, because we incur transport cost uh, to buy from other coal suppliers, uh, it is clear that um, there will be an added cost element. And we are um, working on a proposal uh, in order to establish an inland coal terminal. This inland coal terminal is intended to uh, enable us to buy uh, more coal from so-called junior and emerging miners to ensure that we can control the quality of the coal that we buy and to ensure that we can blend and homogenize and then dispatch, hopefully using a Transnet's rail system as much as possible uh, in order to uh, reduce cost, first of all, but then also secondly, to reduce the impact of uh, coal trucks uh, driving on our roads and um, inflicting wear and tear on roads. So those are some of the, the plans that we've got to, to diversify our coal supplier base, continue to enable the entry of um, new and predominantly uh, black African owned uh, mining companies into ESCOM supplier base, while at the same time ensuring that we get a consistent quality supply of coal uh, at uh, affordable prices. So that, that, that strategy is being rolled out and being worked on in collaboration with Transnet. Um, in order to give the, um, the honorable members an idea of, of uh, black ownership uh, in our um, coal supply uh, Base. I can maybe quote some statistics that would be of interest. Uh, there are two uh, types of uh, suppliers. Uh, so first of all, where there are existing rights, the mining charter in its third iteration requires that it, for existing rights, uh, a minimum of 26% black ownership or shareholding will be recognized as compliant. And then for new rights, uh, this uh, ownership requirement is raised to 30%. Now, for uh, existing mining rights, at this point in time, 82.6% of our coal supply is compliant with this requirement. Uh, and that will go up if the transaction uh, with South 32 or between South 32 and uh, Sariti is uh, concluded because South 32 is one of the mining companies that does not meet that 26% uh, uh, minimum. Uh, similarly, for new mining rights, we are currently sitting at 
79.4% uh, of our supplier base being compliant. And again, uh, further consolidation and corporate activity in the coal mining uh, industry will improve that number over time. And of course, driven by our own procurement activities. Um, Honourable Chair, uh, with regard to the econ oil matter, uh, there are two matters here that are important to consider. Um, the uh, overcharging of 1.2 billion rand um, relates to a five-year period on a contract that ran from 2012 to 2017. Uh, the application to set aside uh, the Bitcorp contract that relates to uh, a 2019 contract. So these are two separate but uh, related matters. Uh, and we have in fact um, been advised and we have followed that legal advice to lay criminal charges in terms of the prevention and combating of Corrupt Activities Act uh, based on uh, determined irregularities uh, in a relationship with a senior ESKIM manager. Uh, so we uh, had to follow the prescripts of the law in this regard, and those charges uh, have been laid. Um, with regard to the question asked by the Honorable Peters on the Howden contract, uh, with your permission, Chair, I would like to hand over to um, our uh, group executive for generation, Philip Dukashi, to please expand on uh, his explanation that he provided earlier. Philip, please. Thank you, Andre. Um, again, honorable chair and honorable members. So Howden has been a supplier to ASCOM for a number of years. Um, the OEM is Balkadel but they had a license agreement with uh, Howden for the manufacture, supply, and delivery of uh, air heater spares. So ESCOM then had a contract with Howden, and <clears throat> sorry, this contract was entered into around 2009, and it was a sole source. And it was riding really on the agreement between Howden and Balkadel, the license agreement. Um, so Balkate is a German company, Howden was based locally, and they were able to manufacture these spares locally. So there was a license in, in place, that license then was terminated, and uh, that was the reason then why Howden could not continue to supply the spares. But we were informed in February um, this year that Howden has had acquired Balkate. And so we, uh, we will be able to, although we have not finalized the commercial process, but Howden has now got that license through the acquisition of uh, Balkata. And so they should be able to continue to supply the spares um, with the license that they had originally. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for that uh, response. Um, we have um, also uh, had a question on the collection of uh, municipal debt, uh, and I wish to ask Monde Bala to deal with the question of municipal debt, but then also on the related question uh, that the Honourable Member asked regarding um, energy efficiency and uh, how, how that is uh, driven and handled. Uh, Monde, please. My sincere apologies, Andre. I did get this connected. I, I missed the question on municipal debt. I will, however, maybe start with the with the energy efficiency uh, question. On, on the energy efficiency programs that we, we are running, we, we, we are still running the programs. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the members would have seen on TV from time to time uh, when we run into challenges of, uh, uh, of supply constraints that uh, we do uh, uh, go on national TV to request uh, the members of the public to, uh, to reduce their consumption. 
Uh, in terms of the programs that we are running, uh, it, it's actually multifaceted, uh, but specifically on residential areas, we are looking at uh, a, a re, uh, 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 sort of a, a resuming the, 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 the water heater uh, uh, program. We've got a lot of uh, installations that are required to be refurbished and uh, new installations to be done. And that program previously we were running uh, it with the uh, uh, DMRE and uh, we're looking at resuscitating that program. So uh, my apologies, Andre, if you can just remind me of the question if, uh, on municipal debt. Uh, Monde, I think uh, the, the honorable member's question related to the prospects of uh, successfully collecting outstanding municipal debt. Oh, okay, no, thank, thank, thank you for that. Yeah, in, 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 in terms of the prospects, I think we're well aware of the uh, state of our municipalities uh, in, in that uh, some of them, uh, the prospects of uh, full recovery is actually non-existent. Uh, our, our focus now is uh, to say, how do we support municipalities, uh, first and foremost, to be able to service their current debt and, and also going into the future to create that capacity within the municipalities uh, so that uh, we, we create a sustainable uh, 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 situation for them to, be, to, to continue to be, to, to be able to service their debt. We are in conversation uh, with National Treasury uh, on how we can deal with the issue of the historic debt. But uh, we do know uh, uh, that uh, the prospects are quite, uh, are quite remote. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, Mr. Director uh, and your team, uh, <clears throat> I'm looking at my time. We are just left with two minutes to the clock. <clears throat> we are aware that we have asked a number of questions and uh, there is still much more that we are supposed to have uh, given us as feedback on those questions and clarities to, our, to the committee. Uh, those members, uh, that those members have asked. So we are now compelled uh, due to time to, uh, to stop just here. And as, as we are saying that we, are, we will need some more time or find some time because it is not the end of the interaction with ESCOM now. And then uh, if the, <clears throat> you want to also put a supplement on those responses that we have asked so far, we are also pleased to make additional on those questions that we have specifically asked but as to the rest of other uh, new matters that we found from the report that we want to respond in future, uh, we will check uh, as we, we continuously interact with you, where can we uh, uh, have a, an interaction with uh, ESCOM. So we regard this as a work in progress and the committee has made it uh, very clear on areas that we are not uh, uh, satisfied with, uh, that we are expecting to see a lot of I mean, drastic improvement in, a, in as far as uh, ESCOM performance is, is concerned, especially with regard to the, uh, you know, being seen as a machinery to boost the economy of the country. Uh, with regard to the economic re recovery. We take note of all those developments that you briefed the committee about, but as, as we are saying as a committee, there is still more that needs to be done uh, that actually deal with these uh, areas of underperformance, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, wrong procurement uh, procedures, and, you know, and, 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 and and other specific areas that the committee has highlighted upon that needs your, your drastic attention so that uh, <clears throat> we can see uh, where we are, we, we are going because we, we can't just keep on, you know, appropriating money, but we don't yield any uh, good results. So uh, we, we want to thank you very much yourself and your team for having submitted this uh, report responses uh, we will keep on uh, touch, in touch with you uh, in future so that we need you 
again to to have a discussion with us in in future but we want to thank for you for for making this presentation with your team and the minister's uh, uh, presence and the deputy minister and the support staff members and honorable members uh, this brings us to the end of the presentation of uh, ESCOM. Uh, we, we, you are released. Thank you very much, Mr. Director, and your team. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Honorable Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chairperson. So, uh, uh, Darren, can you fly to the next item on the agenda? I've got only one minute, two minutes. <clears throat> Yo, you must be a Oh. Yes, the last item on the, I mean, item number five. You want me to flag it? Yes. Okay. Uh, Consideration and adoption of draft minutes dated the 25th of uh, February 2021. Honorable Matafa, I move for the adoption, Chair, as a true reflection of the events that took place on the day. Thank you, Chairperson. Yes, is there any mover of the minutes of the 25th of February? Honorable members? Uh, yeah. Honorable Mlanzana moves for the adoption of the minutes. Uh, the last item, I mean, are there any announcements, Darren? No announcements, uh, Mr. Acting Chairperson. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Members. This brings us to the end of our meeting today. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, the meeting is closed. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson.